thank you very much sir uh, um, good afternoon everybody first uh, i wish to go through the classification of dengue as we know this is the classification we use uh, the as we know most of them are asymptomatic and the symptomatic ones are classified into undifferentiated fever dengue fever and uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever and it is commonly we see these complicated uh, issues in dengue hemorrhagic fever however even in dengue fever sometimes there can be patients with unusual hemorrhages which is not very common uh, there's another classification which we don't use uh, in sri lanka which is uh, where dengue is classified as dengue without with, without warning signs with warning signs and severe dengue uh, when we uh, studied these two classifications what we found was this second classification uh, rather than the second classification the first classification is more user friendly and that is why we continue to use this in spite of uh, who or using this second classification uh, as we know the first outbreak occurred uh, for the dengue was confirmed in sri lanka in 1992 and since then we have been having many outbreaks and initially dengue was mostly seen in the pediatric population uh, for example in 1996 uh, more than 70% of the uh, population were dengue patients were less than 15 years of age however this had been changing and by 2012 uh, more than 70% of patients were uh, about 12 years of age and of this about 50% of patients were within the uh, the working population from 15 to uh, 50 years of age this has been noted in other countries too uh, in countries like indonesia bangladesh and uh, thailand and india and with this uh, we have uh, seen certain differences when we compare the children and uh, adults uh, it has been there have been many studies in countries and uh, this study from vietnam shows that uh, they say the plasma leakage and shock were more common and severe in children than adults while bleeding and organ dysfunction were more frequent in adults uh, we too see a similar picture and uh, again in thailand they found that bleeding is uh, significantly more frequent in adults in singapore too they have uh, had similar findings and uh, uh, so basically in, in dengue uh, most of the pe people will have febrile phase and the convalescent phase however in dengue hemorrhagic fever in between these two phases the febrile phase and the convalescent phase there is this critical phase where plasma leakage occurs and um, generally it lasts for 48 hours if we look at a case uh, was transferred to us from uh, japura hospital some time back the patient was managed there for about 36 hours and on admission to us he was stable however his platelet count was for 16000 with a hematocrit of 27 and ultrasound showed moderate ascites because the hematocrit was low in spite of having plasma leakage we decided to transfuse him with the patrest cell and with that the hematocrit increased to 29 but again dropped to 27 within 7 hours another platelet another full uh, patrest cell was transfused and then the hematocrit increased to 30000 and then um, he was again the hematocrit dropped and he was from time to time getting tachycardia and the liver enzymes uh, rose to ast rose to 1370 and uh, we transfused another pint that the third pint in spite of this there was no signs of bleeding uh, and uh, the liver enzyme went up further ast 2869 and alt 2516 inr was marginally high and then the next day the patient was complaining of inability to extend the leg and he was keeping the leg in the semi flex position and then we did the ct scan of the abdomen and which showed this is what it showed bleeding into into psoas muscle uh even though i put this uh, under this problematic case this sort of cases are not uncommon uh, we are the evidence of bleeding is not evident uh however we see the pcv is dropping and the patient is becoming unstable either with tachycardia and if it continues to uh, go on we will see patient going into hypotension and shock so therefore this is something which we have to always keep in mind in, in these patients as i said at the beginning bleeding is common in adults 
bleeding can occur without patient going into shock. And therefore, we have to anticipate bleeding in all the dengue patients. And as the bleeding is not evident often, we have to go with other uh, changes in other parameters like the uh, drop of hematocrit or uh, unstable parameters where uh, hematocrit is uh, without the uh, rise of hematocrit. This lady, a 51-year-old lady, admitted with history of fever for three days with vomiting and myalgia. On admission, the plated count was 112,000 with hematocrit of 28. Antigen was positive. And then uh, on day five, the hematocrit increased, plated went up to 38, uh, plated dropped to 38,000. And the ultrasound showed the earlier ascites. So uh, the output dropped and we increased the fluid. And then the, the hematocrit dropped further, there was no signs of bleeding. However, the, because the patient was uh, unstable, we decided to transfuse her, uh, her point of uh, factored cells. With that, the hematocrit increased. And, but then again, the hematocrit continued to drop. And uh, she was complaining of uh, left her lower mid abdominal pain. Uh, to keep her in a stable condition, we had to give another transfusion. Uh, when we repeated the ultrasound scan, it showed a thickened uh, rectus muscle and they queried the hematoma. Uh, so later we did the CT scan and you can see the thickened rectus muscle with, uh, with bleeding into this. And you can see it here very nicely. When you compare with the rectus muscle on the left side, you can see how the, uh, this other rectus muscle was thickened due to bleeding into the muscle. Uh, later, the patient's uh, patient, the fever continues in spite of rising uh, platelet, and it was uh, the, the low abdominal was abdomen was tender. Uh, we continued on antibiotics, which just started empirically initially, and then uh, since the patient was uh, showing evidence of sepsis uh, after uh, much deliberation, the, we decided to go ahead with an exploration laparotomy, and that showed the uh, rect uh, rectus hematoma with necrotic muscles. And when that part was removed, uh, the patient became stable and later the patient was discharged. So once again, this highlights the, the bleeding which can be occult in these patients. And this is uh, a rare case where, where uh, it got infected leading to sepsis. This is the, the dissected uh, part of the muscle. Uh, this boy was admitted uh, from a transfer, initially admitted to a private hospital, later he, were, he was transferred to us. Uh, he had evidence of plasma leakage, so we adjusted the fluid intake accordingly and he, he was uh, stable throughout. However, his uh, fever continued. Then on, uh, uh, and he was ill with complaining of generalized abdominal pain and there was some tenderness also. So suspecting a possible intra-abdominal infection, we started the empirically on antibiotics. And then the, the plasma leakage we thought stopped and he started diuresing and the plated count started to rise. And the abdominal pain continued and there was tenderness and the fever too continued. So there was a high suspicion of intra-abdominal infection. And on day eight, the plated count went up to 143,000. And then we thought it is time to uh, get surgical opinion because uh, what we suspected was whether it could be an intra-abdominal abscess. Uh, the parents uh, wants to uh, get the patient to a, a private hospital again. So we transferred the patient and uh, on transfer, uh, we thought of doing a CT scan straight away and the CT scan showed the ruptured appendix. And the plated count was 146,000 there also when the patient went there and the patient went uh, had the laparotomy. Uh, and then in the night, I got a call saying that the patients, uh, so of course it's a surgical condition. Now I thought the plated count has gone up. So I didn't expect any problems as far as dengue is confirmed, uh, concerned. But then I got a call around uh, eight, eight o'clock in the night saying that the patient's hematocrit has dropped to 35 from 38. So I said to transfuse the blood. Uh, then uh, actually I didn't inquire about the patient after that because I thought it's more sort of surgical thing but then next day early morning I got a call uh, 
the patient had problems. The, the, when uh, uh, it was told to the surgeon that uh, we suggested to give a blood surgeon has thought it's not necessary. Of course, uh, generally you don't give blood after uh, an appendicectomy. Uh, but then in the night, the patient collapsed. And then the surgeon had to come in the middle of the night and reopen the abdomen to find that there was a lot of oozing everywhere. There was no single point of bleeding, but the patient had hemoperitoneum, which was evacuated, blood was given, and then uh, it was a complicated case. Later, the patient went into a respiratory failure, acute renal failure, he was ventilated, hemodialyzed, but finally, fortunately, the boy recovered. And the, interestingly, during this period, he had several thromboelastographies, all were normal. Uh, so we, during this period, we had to give uh, uh, Pactred cells, and in addition, because uh, his, uh, in spite of having normal thromboelastographies, we decided to give uh, 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 Factor 279, there's a preparation with 279 uh, concentrate. Uh, uh, so we gave the Factor concentrate to him, and uh, Fortunately, some of the bleeding stopped and later the, the boy recovered. So interesting uh, point here is that the patient started bleeding in spite of recovering from dengue and in spite of having a near normal platelet count. So probably this bleeding tendency may be continuing, maybe with the uh, fresh platelets still the clotting may not be normal. Therefore, we have to anticipate problems even after uh, the recovery of uh, dengue during the initial couple of days uh, of possible bleeding, when they, especially when they need surgery. There had been studies to see uh, how the, the bleeding scores correlate with, uh, with the hemostatic data. Uh, some studies show the APT, prolongation of APTT and uh, reduction of fibronogen. Uh, however, the clotting factors basically were not uh, deranged closely during the during bleeding of these patients. So it is thought to be due to multi, uh, multiple factors. This uh, patient was admitted many years, about 10 years ago to us, and uh, she was initially uh, stable, but then the, he started plasma leakage. Then later, to uh, cut a long story short, she became unstable towards the latter part of uh, critical phase. And again, uh, we couldn't find the bleeding in spite of she was uh, a point of bleeding in spite of she was dropping her uh, platelet count, uh, dropping her hematocrit. Uh, so we had to uh, put a femoral catheter to keep her stable and to give blood. She went into respiratory distress. We had to intubate and ventilate her. And she, we had to give several pints of blood to keep her hemodynamic stable. And um, then uh, still she was becoming, she was getting better with uh, blood transfusion. Then, then after another four or five hours, she was becoming unstable. So I didn't have any option to do. So I thought uh, might as well try and aspirate the pleural effusion and see whether that can uh, reduce the, uh, the, the increase the lung volume and help the ventilation. So I went ahead with uh, aspirating the pleura. Uh, she was intubated. That's the, this time you can see I was uh, trying to aspirate. And then what we got through the tube was this. We aspirated 1,600 ml of blood. And in the middle of the aspiration, my uh, uh, MO was uh, telling me, so now I can feel the pulse. So probably uh, we thought the patient was having a uh, tension uh, hemothorax. And with the, later we put a tube and uh, then we were able to extubate the patient and uh, then uh, later she recovered, had a complete recovery. Fortunately, in spite of all these uh, liver enzymes uh, kept uh, within the normal range. Uh, so the pleural aspiration has to be done rarely in dengue when there's an uh, possibility of tension new hemothorax or sometimes there can be large effusions causing respiratory distress and in interfering with ventilation. These are rare occurrences. Rarely, one can get pyothorax due to secondary bacterial infections, but these are very uncommon indications, uh, I would say. Uh, on the other hand, aspiration of acidic fluid, need for aspiration of acidic fluid could be more, more frequent. One has to consider 
aspiration when the response to uh, dexran is inadequate in a patient with a lot of ascites if the patient has tense ascites interfering with ventilation or if the patient is having tense ascites with reduced urine output this can be uh, interfering with the, the renal blood flow uh, in such instances what is advised is to check the blood air pressure and if it is high to consider aspiration so the best thing what we do is we put a pd catheter and aspirate it and because then if necessary we can continue uh, peritoneal dialysis in these patients uh, the ideal way to check the blood air pressure is to put uh, uh, the urinary catheter you uh, connect you can connect it to the manometer however what we do in the ward uh, or oh, icu setup is uh, we we connect it to the the, the, the tubing of the uh, uh, giving set saline giving set and then put 100 ml of normal saline and then lift it horizontally if the blood air pressure is more than 30 ml then there's that's a definite indication of uh, for aspiration of the acidic fluid uh, if the blood air pressure is between 10, 10 to 30 then depending on the clinical scenario we have to decide whether to aspirate or not uh, this another case history where the 31 year old girl was admitted with 3 days uh, history of fever and uh, her platelet count was uh, 110000 on admission with a hemoglobin of 32 updated count was gradually dropping to 70000 but he could remain stable and the ultrasound showed a small amount of ascites and gold bladder volidema uh, so we didn't have to uh, change uh, much of fluid that's a little increase and she was stable however the fever continued in a dengue patient if the fever continues more than 5 days generally it lasts for 5 days uh, we have to consider the possibility of a secondary bacterial infection on the other hand it may be a co infection rarely we see uh, or uncommonly we see prolonged dengue fever uh, occasionally it can get prolonged to about uh, t- even 10 11 days the common uh, c- uh, reasons for secondary bacterial infections is the gram negative infections uh, coming from gut organisms therefore it is essential to do a blood culture in these patients before starting antibiotics and the other common reason is uh, in these patients is the thrombophlebitis and um, this one we started uh, on antibiotics because the fever was continuing after day 5 and uh, she was looking ill uh, then the hematocrit started dropping and she was becoming hemodynamically unstable then we start gave her a transfusion generally we expect to see after 5 days uh, a rise of white count and then to after end the end of 6 days generally we start to see a rise of platelet count this is the usual pattern we see in almost all dengue patients however this one the fever continued hemoglobin started dropping instead of rising the platelet continued to drop even after uh, seven, after day 7 and then the liver enzymes are high so in such patient we have to suspect the uh, hemophagocytic syndrome Uh, which is characterized by uh, at least uh, by cytopenia should be there and their ferritin levels are very high now this patient had the 73000 not ferritin level is not just 2 3000s in dengue if hemorrhagic fever the ferritin can go up to uh, sometimes the ferritin can be about 2 uh, 3000s but in this patient it was 70 or more thousand and uh, triglycerides were high and the confirmation is done by doing a bone marrow which showed a moderate hemophagocytic activity uh, so we started on uh, iv ig and dexamethasone on iv and uh, she responded well and uh, recovered fully actually it is a condition which has to be treated quickly early so the one has to have a suspect the diagnosis in a patient whose uh, platelet count is dropping in spite of uh, beyond uh, the illness going beyond 7 days and the fever continues we have to suspect the hemophagocytic syndrome it can be fatal if it is not detected and treated early so there are high fever cytopenia hemophagocytosis so oh, we cannot uh, check of course the uh, killer cell activity uh, the for the diagnosis uh, these are the criteria so diagnosis the continuing fever splenomegaly cytopenia uh, is two cell lines hypertriglyceridemia high serum ferritin and uh of course these two we cannot check uh, 
and the hemophagocytosis. Um, other unusual manifestations could be liver failure, usually secondary to prolonged shock. And the river, really, liver failure can occur in patients without shock. Uh, and one possible reason is the use of NSAs. And uh, other uh, rare one is encephalitis, which is rare and generally is the symptomatic management, which is necessary. Uh, and that's, a, that's a quite a rare uh, occurrence. Uh, I thought of showing this case even though this is uh, this shows how this is uh, um, uh, in a patient who would have been an un uncomplicated uh, made an uncomplicated recovery can went into uh, a severe case uh, because of various issues. Uh, this one is a 17 year old girl admitted around four o'clock in the after in an afternoon. Uh, she had come in with fever for three days. She had nausea, arthralgia, and she had normal, uh, she had menstruation at that time. So these are adequate to suspect dengue in, in a country like ours when they come with fever, headache, nausea, and vomiting. And uh, she was afebrile on admission. And uh, so they have ordered a full blood count and a dengue antigen. And uh, Till next morning, she has had about eight, 800 ml of fluid. And uh, the next day morning, now a dengue patient coming after, especially after three or four days, if they're afebrile, one has to be careful because that's the time a patient can have plasma leakage. So we have to have a closely monitor such patients because uh, otherwise they can go into problems. And the next day morning, the patient was found to have a blood pressure of 90 by 70. And the full blood count done on admission showed the hematocrit of 40, 40 and the platelet of 70,000. And an urgent count was done when the patient, the shock was detected, which showed the platelet count of 44,000 and the hematocrit of uh, 40. Uh, so obviously the patient, uh, and the ultrasound showed plasma leakage. Obviously the patient would have been having leaking during all this period. Unfortunate thing here was uh, the this report, the blood count done on admission was available only next day morning. And because it was not available, probably the patient was not monitored. The patient may, may have gone into shock before this, before eight o'clock, or at least had signs of uh, instability before this. So unfortunately, uh, so the. Uh, uh, full fluid bolus was given at that time, but then the patient was sent to the ultrasound department for about one hour. Patient did not have any fluid, and then the fluid were, had been cut down quite rapidly to a uh, seven to seventy-five ml. Uh, the other important thing here is the patient's admission hematocrit is forty, and at that at here when the patient was in shock, also it is forty. So that shows, and the ultrasound shows plasma leakage. So this shows, in addition to plasma leakage, the patient has had bleeding. So in such instances, one has to give blood quickly, and then the fluid has to be tailed off gradually, not to this low level, because if this happens, then the patient will go into shock again. So that is what exactly happened. The patient's output dropped, blood was given, but late, and later the patient went into full-blown shock, and the later the patient was actually transferred to our hospital, but uh, then it was bleeding acidotic and we could not save. So such things can happen. And uh, therefore one has to keep an open mind uh, to, uh, and monitor these patients uh, carefully uh, because such things can lead to unrecoverable complications in a patient who could have recovered without much of a problem. Sorry, I, uh, there was another slide I won't show you. Uh, so again, in a, uh, what I want to say is, even though you see these problematic or unusual cases from time to time, the commonly these problematic cases are due to either late presentation or not giving proper attention or to changing parameters or, or misinterpretation. Often the problem we, one problem we see is if the urine output is okay, changes in other, other parameters, might be district might have been disregarded 
or else if the blood pressure is okay changes in other parameters might be disregarded and in such instances if the this plasma leakage or bleeding continues and that can lead to an irre irrecoverable uh, situation so therefore any change in these parameters of urine output uh, hematocrit uh, pulse rate blood pressure uh, capillary refill time any of these any changes in any of these parameters is significant one has to anticipate or look for problems uh, if you notice a change in any parameters if you continue to allow that that change parameters to continue without any uh, intervention then it will it will become a problematic case and uh, and sometimes uh, we may not be able to uh, recover the patient uh, thank you uh, thank you very much ananda for that very interesting uh, talk there is one question for you uh, someone is asking can uh, persistent bleeding cause fever in dengue persistent bleeding cause fever in dengue uh, i don't think so the patients we had uh, who, who have showed the evidence of bleeding uh, they didn't manifest as bleeding uh, manifest as fever uh, of course bleeding into abdomen might cause fever due to uh, inflammation but i don't think it is a manifestation of the fever is a manifestation of bleeding uh, one other question ananda uh, how useful is the thromboelastogram the take in uh, in a patient who is in shock and having bleeding do you go by the uh, thromboelastogram or is it useful uh, the the simple answer is useless thromboelastogram is useless in managing dengue don't waste uh, time and money on uh, you doing thromboelastogram okay thank you very much i